guests and attendees for here, from here in Korea. My name again is Nicholas Cho from Wrecking Ball Coffee Roasters in San Francisco, USA. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Uh, price is always a tricky variable, whether you're a producer, coffee roaster, or a, even coffee consumer. Only a few people have clear answers, have much to say uh, on a, in a position of authority when it comes to coffee prices, and this person calling up is definitely one of them. And I'd like to introduce, the, she's the director of coffee supply chain at Fairtrade USA. Round of applause for Colleen Anunu. Good morning, uh, good afternoon. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so my name is Colleen Anunu. I am from the United States and I live in New York. I work for Fairtrade USA, which is the uh, US marketing organization in the Fairtrade universe. And uh, today we'll be talking about coffee prices and coffee costs uh, based on some case studies that we've done at Fairtrade USA in partnership with a number of coffee cooperatives in Latin America. So the title is called, What is a Sustainable Price for Coffee? And we'll see if we can get to that by the end of the presentation. So I didn't know how many people in the room would have an understanding of the general flow of coffee from the point that it is produced to the point that it is consumed. So I thought I would put up a little quick diagram before we dig into any of the additional details. So this is essentially you know, the transfer of money and value and product uh, throughout you know, the, the step of the, every step of the coffee supply chain. Um, most coffee is produced by a type of coffee producer that we would consider to be a small holder producer or what we could, could also call a small producer, small farmer. Um, it's important to remember that coffee is an agri agricultural crop and that it is produced uh, on, on land uh, built land around the equator um, within a certain latitude of the equator, and between 70 and 75% of all coffee in the world is produced by smallholder producers, small farmers that operate their production environment in less than 10 hectares of land, and in many cases, less than five hectares. So on very basic terms, this is how coffee is grown and consumed. So let's talk a little bit about the smallholder producer profile. So the definition of smallholder producers do vary. Um, it's an agricultural producer who relies primarily on family labor. And this person will generally work until they die, basically. Um, so most producers don't retire. They don't have retirement benefits. Uh, they don't have a lot of social security. So as years go on, the tendency of coffee uh, producer age gets older and older. So in the context of, of coffee growing, this happens um, on steep mountainsides generally. Um, they're in areas with very poor infrastructure, dispersed populations, and poverty is uh, generational. So uh, there's a lot of hope for the children of coffee producers to have a better life. So the demographics of the smallholder producer profile, um, as I mentioned, the aging rural population where the tendency just gets higher and higher every year. The average schooling is about third grade. Uh, I would say roughly 50% live below the poverty line, and obviously poverty is defined uh, very, very differently with, um, from different 
international organizations, whether it's $1 per day or $3 per day or even a sort of minimum wage annual um, income. And I would also say that smallholder producers have minimal or no access to credit. Traditional farming for smallholder producers generally means that it is non-mechanized agriculture, that they don't uh, have very high productivity because they cannot uh, generally use machines, um, uh, machines to harvest or create more efficiencies in their production environment. And for marketing purposes, the majority of, of the smallholder producers sell their coffee in the open market without any value addition program. So not a lot of focus on coffee quality. And the context that I'll mainly be talking about in my presentation is that, um, is that of the context of smallholder organized producer organizations or cooperatives. And it's important to understand that of all of the smallholders throughout the world, roughly 5% of them are organized into farmer owned cooperatives. So it's a very small percentage. Here's another look at pricing. Um, quick look, so the uh, transfer of money from a smallholder uh, will generally happen at the farm gate or once they uh, grow, they harvest, they process the coffee and it can be done in various ways. Um, and then they will sell their coffee to the first point of collection. Maybe that is to a cooperative. Maybe that's to an, uh, an, a miller. Maybe that's to somebody that's purchasing coffee and then aggregating it and then selling. So when we think about some of the pricing scenarios that I'm going to be talking about, uh, this is the point of, of, at which I'll say farm gate pricing and this is what I, to what I'm referring. So I wanna say a couple of words about what cooperatives are. So um, cooperatives are farmer owned organizations, businesses, corporations even. Um, farmers own the business. They choose how to redistribute benefits. Um, they can reinvest those benefits into their businesses. They can reinvest those benefits through profit sharing. It really depends on the type of organization, the type of cooperative, and their democratic principles. Um, let's talk a little bit about democracy. So generally, cooperatives have collective decision making. Uh, they participate um, they, in their own needs assessments for, for that reinvestment and create investment plans for, uh, for any of the redistributed benefits. There's generally a lot of transparency based on um, market information, um, accounting, business strategy of that organization, um, including revenue and pricing. And then there's always service provision. So as we were talking at lunch, there's, um, they're both a membership organization, but they're also a business that provides services to those members. Um, that includes technical assistance for productivity, quality control, profitability, and access to market information. One more look at sort of a pricing scenario within the context of the cooperative. So the cooperative would be that, that business there, the collection center. And so you see that there's farm gate pricing for, uh, for the producers, the smallholder producers that are selling to the, the collection center. And then that collection center would then make contracts and, uh, and export the coffee generally um, and receive something that we call free onboard pricing. And that is, uh, that's the, the price of the contract, 300, or sorry, uh, 37,500 uh, 37, pounds of coffee is the general contract for coffee. Um, at that point, they would receive the price and the hope is that that price is higher than what would be, uh, what they pay out to the, their farmer members so that they can stay in business, uh, maintain their, their operating margins, and also offer what we call a second payment back to the grower. So that second payment is really important and we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. 
So let's talk a little bit about the C market and the concept of the free onboard pricing or FOB pricing and give uh, an overview of what's happening in the coffee market today. So coffee prices on an international level for Arabica are primarily determined on this pricing index called the commodities market or the futures market or the C market. And this is basically stating that in the future, there will be a certain amount of coffee and in the future, it will be priced at, at this price. So we're going to make that contract today for that coffee for a future delivery. And you can see that there is a lot of volatility, a lot of spikes and valleys within the, the pricing of coffee over time. And a lot of that is influenced by supply and demand and um, different weather patterns, weather cycles that are affecting supply and demand in different producing countries. A lot of it is influenced by industrial commodities, oil and metals, as well as currency exchanges and then just general speculation or individuals uh, that are purchasing contracts that never have any intention of taking possession of coffee, but are just buying and selling the coffee contracts in general. So that's, those are a, a couple of very quick reasons of why there are so many, uh, why there's so much volatility within the market and a lot of changes. So this is um, kind of the context that we're going to talk about today. Um, this was a tipping point that happened in um, the beginning of September where the, the price for coffee fell below $1 per pound since, and um, the first time in, in many, many years. And this set off a lot of alarm bells for the coffee industry in general and drew a lot of sharp reaction from producers in, um, in throughout the world. Latin America mainly was, was very, very vocal about um, how the market was below $1 and advocating for um, industries to step up and say that this is wrong and to find a new price discovery mechanism for, for washed Arabica in general. Here's what happens. We know that coffee uh, in general faces a lot of critical issues. But these issues are generally compounded by the low market, right? So based on a lot of research that's been done, the majority of coffee farmers rely, especially smallholder coffee farmers, rely heavily or um, in a high percentage of their income is, is from the sale of coffee. So if they have one harvest season per year and 80% of their household income comes from selling coffee, it takes a, it takes a lot of stretching of that, of that cash in order to make it throughout the whole year. So you find that there, um, there are more food insecurity issues, that with labor costs being some of the most expensive costs within the, the general operating um, margins of that business, that there are also labor issues. It's very hard to find cheap labor and this sort of leads to uh, more um, child labor or informal labor with low wages on coffee farms. That there's also credit and bankruptcy issues. So in the context of a cooperative, farmers, smallholder farmers generally receive credit from their organization, their cooperative and then they use their coffee, their future coffee harvest as collateral. So the cooperative takes on a lot of risk. So when the smallholder farmer takes out credit with the future delivery, but needs cash on hand, they don't generally sell that coffee to pay off their debts. They would rather sell that coffee on the side market in order to receive more cash uh, for immediate use. We see that climate change um, is, is exacerbated by, um, by low market prices when a coffee farmer cannot reinvest in their farm. Um, we talked about aging farmers in general and the hope for a better life for, for producers or for their, for their children. 
that those issues are also compounded by the low market. And migration issues, something that we, f that we fear a lot, not me personally, but a lot in the United States where I live, um, we see that there's an influx of migration into the United States from countries in Latin America that have no opportunity, have very limited economic opportunity, and maybe could be considered economic refugees based on the, the low opportunity for long-term profitability and viability in coffee producing areas. Here's an example of, uh, of those producers um, that have banded together from different countries. I don't obviously expect you to read this. This is an example of different organizations, coffee growing organizations and marketing organizations throughout Latin America and Africa who have come together and said, the world must address this issue. The low market prices cannot stand. This is forcing a lot of these compounded issues related to climate change and, and human development and social issues. Um, so let's figure out a way for businesses to step up. And that's really challenging to do when this is the main reality for businesses to, uh, to discover the price of the coffee that they need to buy and then roast and then sell through different marketing channels. So all of this has happened in the past couple of months. Um, these letters, campaigns that were written, uh, a lot of, uh, maybe you've read them here in Korea. Uh, there are a, a lot of articles that have been written by roasters and non-governmental organizations, um, research institutions, stating that the coffee prices are unsustainably low. And it's important to talk about this one valley because it's a really important psychological marker for the industry to sort of rally around coffee prices in general. But in reality, for coffee producers around the world, real market prices have been unsustainably low for many, many years. We could say that coffee prices for uh, a number of growers have been unsustainably low since, let's say here, October 2017. We could say that coffee prices have been unsustainably low since the late part of 2016. Or we could say that coffee prices have been unsustainably low since about 2011 when the market went above $2 a pound. So arriving at these numbers of, of what it means to be unsustainably low, um, we have Fairtrade USA has engaged in some primary research with a couple of different coffee cooperatives in Latin America and um, the Dyson School of Applied Economics at Cornell University to understand more about farm level production costs and what it would mean for smallholder producers in different cooperatives, in different contexts around Latin America to break even, right? So if you look back at, at these lines, you can see here that I say short-term average, a medium-term average, and a long-term average. And so when we're thinking about sustainable prices, what is our time frame that we need to look at for what is sustainable? So we wanted to look at what that, what that would mean. And we have to take a couple of different costs and uh, variables into account in order to get to those different averages. So we engaged in this collaborative research methodology um, implemented by Cornell University. And we wanted to focus on some of the real world decision making, uh, these choices that smallholder farmers were making when they were investing in their coffee production systems. And so we worked with a number of these smallholder cooperatives. The first one, uh, the cooperative's name is Adisa, and they're from Peru. They're a cooperative of, of about 500 or 150 members. So they're very small uh, compared to a number of other larger cooperatives that you would find in Latin America. We also worked with Comsa out of Marcala, Honduras. They're a cooperative of about 1,000 members. 
CESMATCH is a group in Mexico, in Chiapas. They have about 500 members. FCC is based in Cauca, Colombia. They have 750 members. Centro Cafe is a very large cooperative based in Jaén, Peru, and they have 3,000 members. And on the bottom, Soli Cafe have roughly 300 members, and Coopera Andes, based in um, Antioquia, Colombia, have uh, 3,500 members. So we're dealing in very, very different contexts, um, very different, uh, I would say, environmental contexts and infrastructure contexts uh, with different numbers of farmers and different priorities for each of the cooperatives. So I'll be showing you some data from that first line of those five groups, as well as averages, and talk about how we arrived at some of those uh, long-term, medium-term, and short-term benchmarks. So for our research methodology, we identified those three break-even points. Um, and you can see each of the cooperatives that I was talking about earlier uh, with an average as well of all of those groups. So we identified three different benchmarks for each cooperative on both a per unit or per pound basis and on a per hectare basis. And we compare these to the average uh, price that was received or reported was received by each of the farmers at a farm gate. Uh, the break-even point is the point at which the total cost and total revenue are equal. So the first break-even point, this dark blue here, um, that calculates pretty much the average annual operating costs for each benchmark farm at, a, at one of those cooperatives. Those take into account variable costs that are directly related to farm output. So usually anything that's variable, when you have more output, you'll have more costs associated with that. Um, so the amount, this includes the amount of inputs that are purchased. It includes um, you know, those inputs such as fertilizer, compost, pesticides, but it also includes labor costs. Um, labor costs in uh, the harvesting of the coffee, labor costs associated with processing of coffee, and labor costs that are associated with, um, with the sort of maintenance of the coffee farm over the year. This short-term benchmark also includes fixed costs, and those are costs that you have to pay no matter what. If coffee is produced, if coffee is not produced, if you produce 1,000 kilos or 100 kilos, these fixed costs remain the same, and they must be paid no matter what. These include taxes, land taxes, they include some other financial costs, um, such as paying back loans, and they also include tools and equipment. And arriving at this short-term benchmark, we figure that if a producer receives a price that covers this benchmark cost of operations, then that coffee production is viable in the short term, so at least for a year, because these are the annual operating costs. And if a producer does not receive this price or receives a price lower than this benchmark, then coffee is uneconomical to produce in the short term. The second break-even point is the, what we would consider to be medium term, and that's anything longer than a year and maybe up to five years. This includes all of the variable and fixed costs from the first point, and then on top of that builds in depreciation of what we consider to be productive assets over time. So depreciation related to uh, processing equipment or the beneficio or, or the micro mill. Um, it includes depreciation of cars or motorcycles that take the coffee production to the market in order to sell it. Um, and other, other types of tools as well. Uh, could be uh, rakes, it could be uh, pruning shears, rope, anything that's been used within that production environment. So building in depreciation over time and amortizing that over a 10 year period. And the final break even point factors in all of those farm management costs that I just discussed. And then it values opportunity costs associated with land use, associated with, um, uh, so land use, and then labor involved in the management of a farm. 
So if I'm thinking about labor in that first short term break even point, that's mainly looking at labor associated with producing the coffee, the actual physical production of that coffee. But once I t start to think about the farmer and her own management of that farm, then we have to start to value in a different way what that management, what those administrative costs actually are. This final benchmark also includes the first two years of production, which has no productivity, generally speaking. So it looks at labor and material input for uh, building a germinator or building a nursery, and then amortizing those costs over a 10-year period. So that's how we arrive at these different benchmarks. And when we think of long-term, we're really looking at that 10-mark period. And then after that, we would consider um, in the hypothetical example, we would consider a more reinvestment back into the farm and building of the germinator and replanting and, and building the nursery. Um, so these, these groups, um, when they reported, we were reporting at a farm gate price. So if you think back to the earlier slides from this presentation, the farm gate price is different from the FOB price. So in order to arrive at this what we would consider to be FOB, and why we did this is because the general market only thinks in terms of FOB. It's very challenging to think in terms of a farm gate price. So what we did was we took some standard assumptions of the actual farm gate price, and then we considered that there was 80, there could be on average 80% loss in transferring that coffee from parchment to green coffee, and then thinking that if a farmer receives let's say up to 87% is a good figure um, published by recently by the Coffee Barometer and the Global Coffee Platform. If a, if a producer receives 87% of the FOB price, this is how we're then arriving at what that FOP, FOB price would need to be in order to meet that, those benchmarks for each of the producers. So you can see that there's a wide difference between the first group, ADISA, which is based in Peru, Comsa, based in Marcala, Honduras, FCC, based in Colombia, Sesmatch, based in Mexico, and Centro Cafe, a large cooperative, also based in the same town and region as the first one, Adisa. So that's on a per pound basis. But we also factor in those same costs on a per hectare basis. And you can see how widely this changes. So Sesmatch goes from a cooperative that needs to receive a very high price in order to cover their per pound basis to um, having sort of the lowest break-even point, long-term break-even point based on their per hectare basis. So higher productivity or so higher per hectare productivity means that the cost of production is spread across more units, reducing the cost per pound. But higher productivity per hectare requires generally higher investments in the inputs, in the variable costs over time. So those fertilizers and the labor. So the key question is whether increased productivity actually does translate um, into higher return on investment. So here's the general understanding of what profitability uh, actually means, um, and it, it, we, it's a very simple equation with just a few variables. Uh, we're looking at the volume produced, um, total volume produced on a per hectare basis, so the volume times the price um, in the gross revenue, and then subtract out the costs, right? So volume produced, price received, and costs incurred. So a coffee producer's net operating profit is determined by multiplying that volume um, by the price and then subtracting out those costs. Uh, and so when we're thinking about um, what is a sustainable price for coffee, price is only a factor here, right? And when we're thinking about does productivity actually lead to higher profitability, well, productivity is actually only one factor here. So that's why we need to look at all of these things together to really understand what is a long-term sustainable price for coffee. So I wanted to do just a, a quick little case study here, a comparison between 
two of the farms that um, you can see on the left-hand side. Um, we'll look at the total farm size, or the benchmark average farm size for each of those cooperatives. So because they're in um, lower altitude areas, Comsa and Sesmatch in Honduras and Mexico, respectively, have very similar farm sizes. But you can see that their total productivity on the right-hand side varies greatly. Right, so Comsa is a producing organization of about 1,000 members. Um, they are characterized by more modern infrastructure. So their cooperative setting and their technology um, is more modern. They have a lot of services. They have larger scale uh, commercial production capacity. And they export around 300 con containers of coffee per year. Sesmatch is a, another organic cooperative based in Chiapas. And um, in recent years, if you have paid attention to kind of what's, what's been happening in Mexico and what's been happening throughout Central America, is that Mexico has been marred with considerable damage from coffee leaf rust. And their estimated impact throughout the whole country is roughly 40% loss of total production. So they don't produce quite as much. And so they really benefit on a per hectare basis by not investing in their, uh, in their productivity. Um, they don't have highly mechanized or highly te technified uh, production environment. And so they have a much lower yield, right? So on a per hectare basis, they need, more, they need less income in order to break even. But that does not mean because Comsa has much higher productivity, they have more labor costs, they have more variable costs. Um, and you can see here that in the short, medium, and long term, they're actually losing revenue based on their price that they're receiving. Whereas in Mexico, they were able to garner a higher premium for their coffee or receive a higher base price. And even though they had lower productivity, they were able to at least meet their benchmark in the medium term. So with Comsa, based on their productivity, the average price needed, that they would need to receive would need to be 23 cents higher in order to break even. And Sesmatch, in order to break even in the long term, they would need roughly 20 cents more. But still, they're more profitable based on their farming productivity and uh, input practices. Here's another look at sort of the breakdown between those two groups and uh, how much they're investing in their labor and inputs in a one-year period to produce the type of, um, or the volume that each of them produce. So with Comsa, you see that their farm size is little over five hectares and their productivity is 4,300 pounds and their price received on an average basis at the farm gate was $1.20. Whereas Sesmatch, their productivity is much lower. The price received was much higher. They were able to meet their medium term benchmark of staying in business. And they have much less investment in variable costs. So, I mean, that's just kind of a look at farm costs in general. Um, and now we have to think again about the sustainable price and why uh, these market interventions, uh, certain market interventions, be it specialty coffee, be it fair trade, um, anything that really is, is advocating for a higher base price and then higher premiums back to producers are really important. Because if you look at the way that coffee is priced on the international market as that price discovery mechanism, you see that coffee has been unsustainably low for many years. Right? Here are those average benchmarks again. So we see that between all of those groups, if we take an average of those, those different benchmarks, that it's been unsustainably low in the short term for about a year, 
two years at the medium term, and I would say probably seven years in the long term. So I wanted to take a look, because I work for Fair Trade, um, I wanted to take a look at, at their, uh, their different pricing mechanisms uh, for specialty coffee or just general commodity coffee. So taking those benchmarks, thinking about how important it is to have a, um, to have that market intervention, to have a base price of $1.40, where that returns more to growers. If you are producing a coffee and it's sold under fair trade terms, then that coffee is sold at a minimum price at the FOB level of $1.40. If you're producing a fair trade certified organic certified coffee, the price of that coffee is $1.70 per pound. And then on top of that, each of those types of coffee receive a 20 cent mandatory premium on a per pound basis that can, if you are producing and selling as a fair trade organic coffee, ultimately the real price of that coffee is $1.90. And this is for all types of coffee for every single context, every single origin that is producing uh, Arabica, washed Arabica coffee. Right, and so that's really important safety net for all of these producers and all of these cooperatives to be selling their contracts on um, fixed term or sometimes differential basis with future delivery. So they know that they're able to take their contract at $1.90 per pound and then leverage that to receive credit from, from creditors. They know that they're able to uh, pay forward for their uh, their farm or their their membership's uh, productive capacity, and they're able to buy that coffee from their membership. So that twenty cent premium, um, if you think back to the earlier part of the presentation where we were talking about second payment and how important it is for for the second payment to come into play in the overall uh, big picture of of coffee farm productivity and viability, that. The fair trade premium, um, if you look here, over the years that, that we've captured premium information, 25% of that uh, 20 cent per pound premium is dedicated to direct payments to the members. So you can look at this graph and say, okay, sure, so uh, an organic fair trade coffee is $1.70, but we can't just add that 20 cents to it because that, that's a premium, it's not a direct payout. Well, in the case of a really low market, when producers need more income um, at both the farm gate, but then later on in the year to pay for other things associated with, uh, with farm, like farm, and farm productivity and management, but then household, that that payment is actually directed in many cases to, uh, to the individual farmers. And what they use that second payment on, um, in many cases, is maintenance and renovation of their farm, but then also food and payments to harvest workers, school fees, things that are associated with the household. So important to think about, uh, about many different ways, many different facets of a total household income or a total farm income that's not just at the farm gate price. And so, wanted to sort of close out this section before we go into the Q&A with Nick to think about what, what really is that sustainable price for coffee. Is it $1.40 at a fair trade minimum? Not always. Is that an important safety net? Absolutely. Um, is, is, the, is a sustainable price actually uh, you know, $1.70 minimum? Probably not. But is it an important safety net? Yes. What is a good premium for specialty coffee? Is it 20 cents? Is it $1.30? Can it be variable? And really what we need to think about is a sustainable price is something that's going to lead to long-term viability, I would say over a 10-year period for whatever production that of a, a, a farm that you're working with will keep them in business over the long term. So, for businesses to ensure that they're paying a more sustainable price, there's a couple of sort of uh, items that I would put on a checklist, right? So a minimum price, 
that meets at least the farm level cost of production in the short term, that the sellers of that product have a right to uh, fix that contract or to say, this is actually the price that I want to sell to you. Um, right now, that doesn't exist in the marketplace as a, as a criteria for, for setting contracts. That additional premiums for quality or compliance are paid that actually mean something, that those, um, those premiums then can be voted on or redistributed by members or individual farmers, that, that uh, actual businesses, coffee roasters, don't dictate where those prices get invested. The price transparency within your contracts is very important, um, that we understand not only the FOB price, but we need to understand the intermediary or the, the exporters and importers. We need to understand what their margins are. Um, we need to understand the risk associated with different types of contracting. And we need to be able to assure that uh, farmers have access to contract financing. Right? So if we're buying on a differential basis and there's no fixed price, it's very challenging for those cooperatives to actually get insurance um, price insurance, and it's very difficult for them to get financing as well. So what is a sustainable price for coffee? There is no standard definition, but there are things that we can do in order to ensure that coffee farming is profitable in the long run. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. You're welcome. Let's have a seat. Would you like some water? Yeah. Thanks for your presentation. Um, super interesting, uh, super important to understand. As, but a lot of that, you know, in context of the Korean market, ends up being a little bit understanding how the general industry works, especially when it comes to green coffee trade, specifically, of course. Um, but when we're talking about the Korean market, we're talking about um, where there's a farm gate on one end, and then you have maybe, you know, if I'm going to speak uh, openly, where a large market like the U.S., buyers might pay. But in Korea, being a, a smaller market ends up being another price. And so I guess I want to talk a little bit about how to sort of reconcile that kind of, kind of difference. Like, you know, in what ways, in terms of the way that, especially on the, on the higher specialties end of things, I guess maybe that's the way to draw a parallel is like, how does this relate to, you know, we talk about safety net, that's kind of the bottom. So, but when you go up higher, how does that relate back the principles and, and, and everything that you're talking about relate back to um, the way that people are buying coffee. So I would say if in Korea, uh, most people understand what an X warehouse price is rather than an FOB price, um, they can still get that information. And I think that the- Well, let's define X warehouse. In that okay, so X warehouse um, would be the price that a roaster is paying if they're contracting or taking possession of that coffee when it leaves a warehouse, um, if it's in Korea or if it's a warehouse that's in some other country, I'm not, I'm not quite familiar with how those supply chain dynamics are for the Korean market. Um, so that's, that would be an X warehouse price and it's generally higher than the FOB price because it includes more cost of shipping and more uh, price risk management strategies and uh, insurance, that's, that type of stuff, plus a margin for the importer. So if you're looking at the price that you're paying for a high quality coffee, and let's consider it at that point, X warehouse, you can still understand and ask that importer what was the price that was paid at the FOB level. And I know we talked about this prior to coming on, and, and you said, yeah, but there's, there's, not, uh, there's not the same parallel with the United States market versus the Korean market in terms of the type, the, the different prices that are paid or the different point at which these roasters are contracting. And my point is, is that you need to know what the FOB price is for that coffee in order for coffee to be sustainable in the long run. 
right? We can't just rely on the prices at the X warehouse level. It is the right of you as a coffee buyer. It's the right of the industry, and I would say that it's the responsibility of the industry all around the world to understand much more about coffee production economics, but then also the price of that coffee that was paid at the FOB level when it left that port, port of origin. Right, now this is interesting because for anyone who's in the audience who buys green coffee, uh, high-end specialty coffee or specialty coffee in Korea, um, that idea of everyone should know, mm -hmm. that's not the way these things go. Um, the, the prices here are gonna be about what they're offered at and what you can buy mm -hmm. and what you pay. Essentially, I mean, you said X warehouse. I mean, a lot of the coffees in Korea are, are delivered and so there's that extra, um, extra sort of charge as well. Mm -hmm. But when in the United States, a container comes from a port in Ethiopia or you know, Central America to a port in the US, it's easier to track. And also, the business culture in the US, that transparency mm -hmm. is a value that is, maybe you could say, part of the culture, right? We want to know, you're going to give it to us. Mm -hmm. Whereas the history of specialty coffee in Korea, you know, it was not that long ago that most of the coffee was coming secondary market through Japan. And now, rather than being able to buy more direct, it's still coming through a secondary market, a lot of it through the United States, you know, and, and other places like that. And so, you know, I guess that's a challenge for our Korean industry here in terms of being able to not only meet the demand in terms of I want to know the transparency, but you're making a case even further, which we must know. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit more. Right, so there's every incentive in the world, as you saw with the market, that, um, that, that the, the first intermediary, the first organization to buy coffee for a roaster or for their spot position will, will purchase it at the lowest price possible. And if we currently do not have that level of data available, to really understand at what is the price that's being paid uh, to, to growers or to exporters or to cooperatives um, on, um, you know, on an annual basis all across different origins. And so we'll never get to that level of specificity. We'll never get to this level of understanding, well, what is then a sustainable price for coffee that's going to keep producers in business in the long term that should be our goal, um, unless we are actually forcing the hand of the people that we're purchasing from to say, what are your margins? What did you pay for this coffee? And how can I ensure that the price that I'm paying, let's say, you know, a $9 a kilo for green coffee, maybe here, um, that how much of that actually got back to the point the point of origin, um, at the point of which it left that country. How can I ensure that, you know, seven of those dollars per kilo was just not eaten up in transportation costs and margin? Um, and what, what percentage of that actually needs to go back to the producers in order to keep them in business? That's the kind of thing that um, nobody wants, no, no company wants to give you that information. But we're seeing a paradigm shift in the United States to, um, and to other places in, uh, in, in Europe, I would say, yeah, all around the world, to, to actually get at that level of information because that is responsible sourcing. That actually is more direct trade, responsible relationship type sourcing. And, and in the United States, or Europe for that matter, you know, we haven't talked about it too much, but this, you just said it, like direct, you know, direct trade, uh, the direct purchasing, that sort of idea. Um, I mean, I was there through the development of that in the industry, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And so much of the um, driving factor of that was actually about transparency, specifically, and understanding that 
Uh, you know, we have this term in the U.S. or in English like gatekeepers, right? So who are the people who are guarding the information and holding on to it selfishly because it's of their business interest to do so? And so at, uh, prior to this kind of direct trade revolution, so much of it was in the hands of the importers and exporters. They knew where the coffee was coming from. They you know, knew sort of the price they was paid. And if you wanted to know more, they just basically either pretended they didn't know or they le legitimately did not know because no one ever asked. Exactly. But when the direct trade kind of revolution, if you could call it that, in the mid 2000s happened, it was about sort of exploding that information. And now when we buy a bag of specialty coffee and we know the region, we know the farmer, we know sometimes elevation and variety. I remember when I had coffee shops in 2003 and four, that information was not available. Right. And not even just to me, even the importer sometimes didn't know because there was no demand for that. Mm -hmm. And so here in the Korean market, it's great to see that that part of the value has, has made it here. Right. I've but seen when, that. Yeah, you've seen that. But when it comes to the price transparency, it's, you know, actually you could say it's become in a business way inconvenient. Mm -hmm. So when it's not convenient and the market doesn't demand it, then it doesn't happen, mm -hmm. you know. But, and so imagining you know, that kind of like specialty world where it's kind of like the American market, but then you add on these extra layers that kind of shroud everything and also add cost. I mean, what would you imagine? Like, what would that market look like? What would be the problems with something like that? Well, first I would say that even if a market doesn't demand it, and say the consumer culture here is completely different and they're looking for a different level of information, you know, there's so much about what has happened in the specialty industry in the United States, let's say, that was, uh, the, the consumer market was created by those, those sort of industry professionals and those businesses saying like, but th this is important and you just have to learn about it. And I think that that's, we've done that with barista competitions, we've done that with you know, certain brew ratios that now everybody takes for, gr you know, for granted. Um, and so just because the market isn't actively looking for this level of price transparency and maybe they really don't care, um, that doesn't mean that it's not sort of important for the long-term health of the coffee industry and your business. Um, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. Yeah, because either you're part of the problem or you're part of the solution. Yeah. But if you don't know, you don't get to decide even which one you are. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but no, I mean, I, I completely understand that there are just added layers of complexity to the supply chains coming into different countries, especially if they're getting routed through different, uh, different areas where coffee's being warehoused. If they're you know, going into Australia and they're being warehoused there, but then roasters here are pulling from those warehouses, there's so many different levels of uh, insurance and custom taxes and you know, import taxes, all of these different things. So that doesn't mean that that data is not available. It just means that it's a little more complicated and the price might be higher. And if the price is higher, that's fine if your market can take that, but that doesn't change what the price was paid to growers right. in the end, right? And so that's, that's really where we have to start peeling back the layers and saying, okay, maybe I don't care about the insurance and import costs. I wanna know though what the price was paid at FOB and then who actually exported that coffee you know, how many, how many layers between that export process and the growing process were there? And how can I be sure that there, there was an adequate payment to those producers? I don't expect roasters, even in the United States or in Europe, to do this level of cost of production analysis. And it's very different because we're just talking on an average basis for cooperatives. Cooperatives that sell high quality micro lots to organizations like Cafe Imports, right? Seth's Match in Mexico. They have a they have a micro lot program. They have a woman's coffee program. They garner a lot of of premium, um, and they work very closely with Cafe Imports, let's say. But they also produce a lot of base level commodity type coffee as well. So we're looking at just the average. Um, but we can't be sure at this point in time. Well, what 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 does that micro lot coffee actually need in terms of a price in order to make that a sustainable venture in the future? So we're looking at you know, these, these sort of like on a, on a per pound basis, but also on a per hectare basis. And, and we know that you can't produce all micro lots on all of your, your coffee land. Um, 
But you know, really starting to understand and have those conversations, the more detached you are, the less you're going to have the, that level of insight and to really ensure that you're doing, you're engaging in business practices that are the best for the growers, right? Right. And that's what we need to start doing because the, I mean, coffee industry is going to continue for, for many years, regardless of the market intervention, regardless of any NGO intervention. Um, but that premium coffee, that specialty coffee, the coffee that's differentiated by the taste, that's going to go away. It's going to be less diverse. It's going to be concentrated in particular areas which make it very economical to produce, like Brazil. Um, but yeah, I mean, these special regions that we are putting on our packaging, you know, we put Huawei Tenango, Guatemala on our packaging. Mm -hmm. We don't need to go there, but you know, you have to understand that that coffee is going to go away in the future. Right. Um, around the specialty coffee world, this is the last question. Um, around the specialty coffee world, there's a lot of attention going to really high priced coffees. And Korea has become, you know, kind of the hot place for that type of, of coffee activity. You know, it used to be a cup of excellence when it started. There's a lot of European and American and some Japanese buyers. And now there's just so many Korean buyers of the, the most expensive lots, you know, and that's a certain trend pattern. Talk a little bit about how, um, how that helps or hurts coffee, the bulk of coffee producers who are producing coffees that aren't at an astronomical high price, mm -hmm. but more at a, you know, closer to a C price. Mm -hmm. like how, you, because you've worked for specialty roasters, mm -hmm. buying expensive coffees in the past as a coffee buyer. Mm -hmm. So it, in your job now with Fairtrade USA, like how do you see that relationship? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? How does it help? How does it hurt? I mean, as with all things, it's all kind of how the user uses that information, right? It's neither good nor bad in and of itself, but it's how we're actually using that information. So I think, I mean, that said, I, I do think that high quality coffees um, and high profile coffees are very important for the coffee industry in general to, um, for, for consumers and, and customers to understand that coffee can be a very, uh, very differentiated product, that it should have higher value associated with it. Um, and then obviously, based on all of those costs to get it there is going to be a different price, right? Like I had an Elin Herto coffee from a very, very high profile farm from Guatemala um, that's been given awards for over the past decade. I had a cup of that yesterday and it was $10 a cup. Um, maybe in the United 10, States. 10,001. Oh, yeah, 10,000. Yeah. yeah, that was my conversion. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and maybe that same coffee would be $8, $8 a cup in the United States based on the cost to get it there. Um, smaller cup in yeah, Korea. Smaller cup. That's right. But it was, you know, it, that's important for, for people to really understand that coffee is, is a very unique product and that it, it's deserving of that. Um, but what I've seen ha happen over the years um, is that th this sort of quest for market positioning based on, on coffee quality and real like premium type of product has led to this polarization between specialty coffee and commercial coffee. And there are commercial coffees that are specialty grade coffees as, as we discuss a lot um, today so far. Um, but yeah, I mean, th we, sh we should be focusing not only on those high quality coffees, but we need to say that those commercial coffees also need to garner a higher premium, right? right? Those, those commercial coffees, they should have a higher base price. They can have a higher quality, uh, quality based premium, or they can have a compliance based premium um, based on whether or not the Rainforest Alliance, certified coffees, you know, whatever. So that's the point. I mean, there, we need to be able to highlight how special coffee can be, but we also need to say that this is all part of a, a, a bigger coffee universe, that the specialty coffees are, are built on the backs of, they're subsidized by these higher, like lower quality uh, co commodity type coffees, but those also are not meeting cost of production. So we need to sort of work across all angles here. Right. To be able to when you're in the specialty sector, sometimes we don't mean to, but by accident, 
we are actually telling our consumers how much we don't care about more commercial coffee farmers. Right. We hate them. We don't care about them because we care about our farmers, and that's actually not what we want to communicate. Sometimes your farmer is actually producing a majority of their product as a commercial grade coffee. So that's the same farmer that you're saying that you love and that you hate at the same time. Right, right. Well, thank you. Well, we don't hate you. Thank you. <laughs> we really appreciate your talk. Colleen, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Round of applause for Colleen.